My guest today is Mark Lawrence, and this week we are going to discuss the Vietnam War. We already made quite a while ago an episode on the Korean War, which I also, which I also recommend checking out. But today we're going to talk about the second of these wars, the Vietnam War. Maybe not second, but it's the right word for it, but that's our topic for today. And of course, as always, how did you get into the Vietnam War? How did you start st- uh, it, studying the Vietnam War? Oh, how did I get into it? Um, you know, it's it's a it's an interesting question that I get asked from time to time. Uh, a lot of people who write about the history of the Vietnam War have direct connections, whether it was you know a family member in the war or you know family who were activists against the war or something like that. That's not really true with me. I mean, I grew up in the sort of immediate aftermath of the war. And I think I just internalized from the political atmosphere around me that this was a really important thing to understand. And as I, as I went through my you know school and then high school and then college, it just loomed really large for someone like me who was broadly interested in politics and in international affairs. Uh, turned out when I went to graduate school, my best language uh, to do research was French, which um, you know was very handy for working on Vietnam, particularly obviously in the in the colonial period, which is where uh, I focus much of my early research. So I came to it, I think, ju- through a kind of general sense that this was a really pivotal event in American international history, but also in American political and social history. Um, and it it just kind of drew me drew me in, and uh, I think it was a it, it was a good choice given the amount of interest there still is in the war. Hmm. And of course, we don't. Uh, before we begin, we you know we don't start with French leaving and what built up to the Vietnam War eventually. But I want to begin with comparing both Korean War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. But and um, I want to begin with what do you think makes the Vietnam War still so popular in today, both in media and in historical writing because the, as you know the Korean War is I mean, discussed this in the episode as well we made it it's almost forgotten in yeah. a sense you don't see yeah. and almost any movies related in yeah. of course you drop MASH which is you know we don't want to come back to but you know yeah. <laughs> there's almost no media or, or films in the setting in the Korean War where you got uh, an entire archive full of yeah. Vietnam in, in media and popular culture so what do you think it is about Vietnam were the plane is so popular versus the Korean War, which is nuts. Yeah, well, I I mean, I think that um, you know, Viet the outcome in Korea was very ambiguous, right? It it all of that fighting, all of that bloodshed resulted in a kind of a a, a draw in the end, a restoration of the status quo. And, um, you know, the Korean War was certainly controversial in its time, but I think in comparison to Vietnam, it did fade into the background in part because Vietnam was so conspicuously a defeat for the United States. Mm -hmm. And this was something that stirred a lot of commentary and controversy and angst among Americans who had been used to winning winning their wars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this was only... Uh, a couple of decades after the Second World War, this massive undertaking that, uh, you know, Americans have come to think of as, you know, the good war where everything sort of went right for the United States. There seemed to be almost no challenge in the world that the United States couldn't solve through its power, its will, its its economic, its prosperity. And then this uh, war in Vietnam proves all of that wrong. So I think it was it was very jarring and kind of cut against uh, it's Americans' expectations of what their country mm-hmm. was about and and stood for in the world. I also think that the Vietnam War is far more um, is far more controversial and kind of radioactive for Americans because of when it occurred during the 1960s. So it took place against this backdrop of rapid social change, and for that reason, I think the war became entangled with really profound questions for Americans about the nature of their society, about the obligation of individuals to support their government, about the obligation to dissent against their society and so forth. Um, That really says as much about the larger context of the 1960s as anything specific that happened in connection with the Vietnam War, but that that, that broader context, I think, really matters. Mm. Um, So let's begin with the French leaving the because it was a French colony up until the 53 and the United States did try to make the French leave 
but just you know after Second World War Cologne, you know, it was a lot it wasn't really cool anymore. It wasn't what people wanted. They wanted to get rid of colonial, especially the United States, although they had colonies themselves, but you know, they, they they did try to get rid of colonies at the time. But so let's talk about the French leaving Vietnam. Yeah, uh, so the the war between the French and the Vietnamese nationalist movement, uh, of course, erupted. Uh, it's a little hard to date, but somewhere in 1945, 1946. Um, and at first, the United States tried uh, under the you know the presidency of Harry Truman tried to stay out, tried to stay neutral. Um, and and I think this flowed from the fact that Americans were instinctively and ideologically aligned with anti-colonial movements, right? That's That was sort of the origin story of the United States. And so ideologically, a lot of Americans believe that, of course, the United States was on the side of peoples struggling to be free of European colonialism. But uh, culturally, socially, economically, the United States was also deeply intertwined with Western Europe. And so, uh, you know, it was very hard for lots and lots of Americans to get away from the idea that the principal obligations of the United States lay with its closest democratic allies in Western Europe. So there was a kind of dilemma here, you know, which which way should the United States go? And at first, the instinct was to avoid taking a strong position one way or the other through a policy of neutrality. But as you say, after 1950, the United States tilted more and more and more strongly in favor of the French. And I think that at the end of the day, what that meant was that the United States interests in Western Europe outweighed American concerns for Southeast Asia or nationalism more generally. It just wasn't a close call in the minds of many Americans at a time when the Cold War was really looming ever more powerfully in, um, in American minds. It was simply inescapable that the United States had to build up a strong connection to 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 France. Did they, did they kind of lose a little bit of enthusiasm after Korea as well? Was that the kind of little that was hanging after the Korean War? Is that some some part of it as well? Yeah, I, I do think that the, the um, bad aftertaste of the Korean War had an important role to play in how Americans thought about the Vietnam problem in that 1953-1954 moment. So uh, the Korean War, of course, comes to an end in 1953 through the armistice. Uh, it's it's at that very time when the 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 war in Vietnam is really um, you know uh, uh, um, uh, growing and becoming more and more intense, and also when the French were more and more and more struggling to hold their own against an increasingly powerful uh, Vietnamese nationalist and now uh, strongly communist movement um, as as well. So. Uh, the question that confronted Americans, especially during the Dien Bien Phu crisis of 1954, was, well, should the United States go beyond economic and military support of the French and intervene in Vietnam with its own forces, whether bombing or maybe even ground forces? Mm -hmm. And the effect of the Korean War was to convince the Eisenhower administration that under no circumstances was the United States going to get involved in another ground war mm. in Asia, right? This was the lesson that the, the the debacle in Korea taught many Americans. And so I think the, the Korean War really made clear that Americans wanted no part of direct involvement in another Asian war. What are they, Stroll? <laughs> 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 didn't last long <laughs> no <laughs> you just i think that's fair but yeah let's talk about because i don't know the french do leave eventually and uh, of course that makes the geneva accord in splitting up north versus south was was there more heavy communism in the north which is what what, what would cause the split up between vietnam as in korea so in in the spring of 1954 the uh, the nationalist uh, forces, and, and I think it's reasonable to call them communist forces by this point, um, were really, um, you know, had, had the upper hand, uh, were, were um, increasingly powerful with lots and lots of Chinese support, of course, and dealt the French a major defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Given the, the battlefield realities in Vietnam, there was every reason to expect that the outcome of the war with France would be Vietnamese independence under the control of Ho Chi Minh's government. Mm. 
right? That's what the battlefield realities seem to suggest should be the outcome. But that was not the outcome. Instead, Vietnam was split uh, famously at the 17th parallel between uh, one zone, the North, what became North Vietnam, that was under Ho Chi Minh's government that became a communist oriented country. And then South of the 17th parallel would be a separate uh, entity that would also grow into uh, a state over time that would be under the control of uh, Vietnamese forces that had fought alongside the French during the war. So the outcome of the war, in short, was a kind of Korea-like hmm. situation where the country was divided. The goal, of course, under the Geneva Accords was to do away with that split, to reunify the country in 1956. But of course, uh, that process was never allowed to play out and North and South Vietnam became more and more distinct countries. Why did this happen? It had to do with the interests of the great powers. It had to do above all with American in, um, concern about what would have been a massive expansion of communist influence in Southeast Asia if all of Vietnam had fallen under um, communist rule. And more interestingly, it had to do with the Chinese and Soviet position in the Geneva Agreements. The Chinese and the Soviets wanted no part of a major American intervention in Vietnam. So they accepted that the best solution in Vietnam was to divide the country um, in, in the expectation that this would at least partly satisfy the Americans and keep American power out of the region. Mm. Before, and we're going to get into the war in a second, but I do want to build up a little bit before we get into the war stuff. And if you can, I want to talk a little bit about the background of Ho Chi Minh and how he rose to come this power. Yeah. You know, Ho Chi Minh has a fascinating life story, and there are many mysteries uh, that still surround Ho Chi Minh to this day, uh, in part because we simply don't have the sources necessary to fill in important holes in his story, but also because his story has been so mythologized over the years, I think. As, but, as, you know, as with every communist case. No, that's probably fair, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what we know is that he was born in, in the early 1890s in a relatively privileged position. He he he, he was the um, the son of a Confucian elite uh, in, in the central area of Vietnam, um, where nationalism, where the need to um, push back against French control and restore an independent, robust Vietnamese state was very much part of the daily conversation. So Ho Chi Minh grew up in a world where nationalism and um, the need to, to get rid of French rule was very much in the air. Ho Chi Minh's early political orientation, though, was I think what we might reasonably call kind of liberal anti-colonialism. His, his guiding idea was that, you know, the West should live up to its own principles. Americans and other Westerners talked a good game about self-determination and liberty and all that good stuff. So uh, the French should simply be held to their own standard and Vietnam should be made independent very much on the Western idea of how nation states should um, look like. And, you know, uh, and, and the illegitimacy of of uh, foreign uh, colonial uh, rule, but you know Ho Chi Minh has a very formative experience around the time of the First World War, and, and especially the uh, Paris Peace Agreement, where Ho Chi Minh, like nationalists from other colonized territories, came to Versailles and appealed to the Western powers, Woodrow Wilson and Georges Clemenceau and David Lloyd George essentially to live up to their own principles and put colonial territories like Vietnam on a path to independence. And the Western leaders barely even, you know, barely listened at all. There was no response. There was nothing um, in the way of any kind of accommodation for nationalist movements. And the effect that this seems to have had with Ho Chi Minh and with other nationalist leaders, by the way, as well, was to drive them toward a more radical politics. It was really only in the aftermath of this huge disappointment that Ho Chi Minh looks to Leninism, looks to the Soviet Union, to the common turn as this, the, as the institutions that would support Vietnamese nationalism. So, um, you know, communism, 
uh, wasn't wasn't uh, Ho Chi Minh's first choice, but it it became increasingly important, certainly, uh, to his outlook and to his vision of how Vietnam would gain its independence. So in in the end, it was kind of a means to an end, if you will. I think that's right. Ho Chi Minh was was very eclectic in his ideology. I think many many biographers have made this point. By the 1950s, when he was really at the peak of his power and influence. You know, he could still talk in a Western idiom. He could still talk about uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? He could still talk about um, self-determination in a Wilsonian sense. But he also could talk the talk of international communism. And he was indeed a founder of the French Communist Party in 1920. So he could do he could kind of play play it both ways. He spoke in different idioms when the, when the need arose, you know, to appeal to the West or to appeal to the communists. And this was one of his great assets. It's all as as a political leader. It's also one of the things that makes it so difficult to understand him, because depending on where you look, you can see very different Ho Chi Minh's. So, so what? Well, why did they choose to you know cross the seventeen parallel and attack torpedo? What made them want going over and crossing the Geneva Accords and attack the U.S. torpedo boats? Just a second. Yeah. Turner Joy and you know Maddox. Oh, okay. So, um. What are the origins of the, yeah. the the bigger war in the early yes. 1960s? Well, um, you know, long story short, uh, following the division of Vietnam in 1954, um, there developed in South Vietnam a rather repressive, unrepresentative government under the leadership of a fascinating character named No Din Diem. And by the late 1950s, his his rule was increasingly under threat from a reanimated um, uh, nationalist movement within the borders of southern Vietnam. Um, lots of people who had been fighters against the French in an earlier era now were fed up with this new regime. And so No Din Diem's government faced an increasingly powerful uh, guerrilla movement against the South Vietnamese government by the very late 1950s. Ho Chi Minh and his government across the across the 17th parallel understood what was happening in the South and were faced with a critical dilemma. Should they support this growing uh, guerrilla nationalist movement below the 17th parallel? And gradually, there's a lot of debate around this question, but gradually the North Vietnamese leadership came to the decision that yes, the moment was right to start sending troops and supplies from the North into the South to support this new uh, nationalist movement um, that was increasingly using violence against the South Vietnamese government. So this process played out across 1959, 60, 61, 62, and the amount of violence, the amount of unrest in South Vietnam grows and grows and grows across that time. And the uh, stability and security of the South Vietnamese government, which of course was closely allied with the United States by this point, was increasingly in jeopardy. You know, you ask about the Gulf of Tonkin episodes, this was, of course, an episode that happened in August of 1964. By this time, the United States had sent thousands and thousands of military advisors to try to support the South Vietnamese government. The, the United States was providing all kinds of military intelligence gathering, economic, political support for the South Vietnamese government. Um, and in August of 1964, an American warship uh, was operating off the coast of North Vietnam, gathering intelligence, and it came under attack by North Vietnamese patrol boats. A couple of nights later, there appeared to be a similar episode. We now know that uh, the American ship in this, in, on this second occasion actually did not come under attack. There was a lot of confusion about what was going on. The, the weather was bad. An American sonar operator appears to have misunderstood what was actually happening. But the first attack did happen. And, and so the Gulf of Tonkin episodes showed to American leaders that the North Vietnamese not only were going to support, you know, in a very powerful way, the insurgency in South Vietnam, but they were also going to uh, attack the United States as the principal ally of South Vietnam. And this was understood as a major provocation and became the pretext 
in the United States for really escalating American involvement in South Vietnam. Hmm. Now, we this just in the Korean War episode, we made the point while I was talking about earlier, where you know, one then crossed the 38th parallel, I believe, that MacArthur, that MacArthur he refused to believe that it, this happened, that he needed, it took a few days before he reacted to the North Vietnamese crossing the 38th parallel. So mm. was it kind of similar in this case, or did they react immediately when they heard a fire shot, shot upon the torpedo boats? Um, you know, after the first uh, attack, there was certainly a lot of concern in, in Washington. Uh, after the second attack, it's pretty clear that political leaders, Lyndon Johnson um, in Washington, um, believed that they really had to act. Um, and in response, very quickly, the Johnson administration ordered uh, uh, air attacks against the North Vietnamese coast as a reprisal against the um, against the attacks, actually one attack and then one assumed attack. So this came very, very quickly. And I think that reflected a sense that, you know, American prestige and um, honor were at, were at stake if this if this attack went un um what went went unaddressed but it's also important to bear in mind that august of 1964 was the, in the thick of a presidential race in the united states and it's awfully clear to me that lyndon johnson um carried out this brief but very um robust attack against the north vietnamese coast to play to a domestic audience he needed to show that he was tough he was as tough as his very hawkish Republican rival, Barry Goldwater. So uh, politics was part, I think, uh, of the calculation as Americans decided how to respond. Was it a popular move to move into Vietnam at the time? What did I, and, and again, I'm sorry for referring to yeah. Korea so much here, but was, yeah, know this. was the masses like with Korea, what, where the pop, was it but for a move into Vietnam at this time? As we know, of course, it turned around eventually, but at the, exactly. in the beginning. At this point, there's no question it was extremely popular, right? Um, the the attacks uh, in in response to the Gulf of Tonkin episodes uh, were enormously popular. Um, LBJ accomplished politically exactly what he hoped to accomplish, I think, which was to satisfy the American public that he could act boldly to defend American interests. Uh, maybe not as boldly as his rival, Barry Goldwater, but that was a good thing for Lyndon Johnson because he was trying to paint Goldwater as an extremist, whereas Lyndon Johnson was uh, a, someone who could be trusted with power, who would use power vigorously when American interests were on the line, but also was responsible with the use of American military power. So it was really um, the, the whole episode really served Lyndon Johnson uh, beautifully in that particular moment. And this reflected the fact that it was uh, a very popular, um, a very popular move in in the summer of 1964. Let's talk about recruit, rec sorry, recruitments for so of soldiers for the war. Were people signing up for voluntarily, or did uh, how, or how how much did the draft get of volunteers, and who were it better than the forced commissions, not commissions maybe, but you know, how, let's talk about the drafting of soldiers for a little bit. Yeah, I think there's a, a general perception that, you know, the, the American military in Vietnam consisted, you know, entirely of, of volunteers, excuse me, of of um, of draftees um, sort of, you know, fighting against their will. And over over time, there's some truth to that. The percentage of American servicemen and women who were uh, draftees grew uh, over time, but it, it was never... Um, uh, a hundred percent by any stretch of the American military force. Professionals remained a significant part of the American force uh, in Vietnam um, throughout. But certainly, you're right in suggesting that as the years passed, the draft calls increased, and the the percentage of the overall fo force that consisted of draftees uh, grew, and the percentage of professional military people uh, declined, ex exactly as you would expect, because the manpower burdens were so enormous. Were, were there many ex-veterans from Korea signing up, hoping that this would be another case, kind of like, like the Korean War, that they were fighting? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't have a statistic off the top of my head, but certainly I anecdotally have run into cases of uh, you know, officers who had served in Korea, who remained in the military mm-hmm. and then fought in in Korea, excuse me, in Vietnam, uh, you know, typically as more senior officers. Um, the you know, your average draftee, of course, would have been much, much too young to have experienced Korea. But certainly when you're talking about uh, officers, many of them had served in Korea and, and some even in the Second World War. Look at William Westmoreland, the overall commander for a good chunk of the American war. Um, had served in both the European theater of the Second World War and also in Korea. I, I remember reading about the Vietnam War quite a while ago, and I remember reading that there was, a, I do believe it was a Second World War soldier who fought both in the Second World War and Korea, and he was so restless that he couldn't settle down for civilian life that he didn't draft again to Vietnam when that happened. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, this seems to happen, you know, throughout maybe throughout all of American history, but certainly during the Cold War era, um, uh, military officers who kind of cut their teeth and you know learn learn the ropes as, as young people hung around and then uh, returned to the battlefield in many cases in the next war to come along and brought to bear the lessons that they had uh, learned or at least uh, thought they had learned of the earlier experience. Uh, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of American military commanders in connection with Vietnam for having fought the war too much like uh, Americans had fought the Second World War or Korea. Um, I'm not saying this is a correct view, but uh, generals of Westmoreland, above all, have often been criticized for a lack of creativity in in, in, in a failure to understand that what was needed in Vietnam was very different from what was needed in the European theater or in the Korean War. Hmm. Was a kind of a romanticism in fighting these wars, the later wars of after World War Two, where you go, you know, you're fighting communism, you're fighting against the bad guys, you are the hero, you become welcome back to here, back a hero for your family that is proud of yeah. you, and meet the girl, you know. Was there a certain romanticism about this? I I think so. I mean, you know, um study after study, memoir after memoir after memoir of uh, combat soldiers in Vietnam shows that at least in the early parts of the war, an enormous number of young Americans were drawn to this new fight by a romantic sense that, you know, the United States had done great things in the world during the Second World War. And, you know, in many cases, the the fathers of people who went off to fight in Vietnam had had um, had had positive experiences in connection with the Second World War. So there was a strong sense that this younger generation would now do its part and kind of try to live up to the high standard that the older generation had set. Now, as the Vietnam War dragged on and became less popular, of course, a lot of that luster came off the war and Americans were motivated by different things. I'm not saying that never happened, but I think it happened less frequently once the realities of this war set in and the war became increasingly controversial. But I really think if you look at 1964, 1965, and, you know, sort of uh, were able to do a poll of, you know, um, of, of young men who, who volunteered in particular for the war, and c- certainly many draftees as well, you would see a strong sense of that romantic ideal of service to the nation. Let's talk about one of the main, some of the major battles of the Vietnam War, which among them is, of course, the Battle of La Dan. Of Yo Drang. Oh, La Dan. If I'm so, so, La Drang, I'm sorry if I say this wrong, but the, the Battle of La Drang, I think it's called, yeah. Yeah, fr- it's from the fall of 1965, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the Battle of the Yadrang Valley is, um, you know, one of the most fascinating battles of of the war. I think there's no question about that. This was in the very early days of the big American military commitment in Vietnam in the fall of 1965. So I think military historians correctly have often held this battle up as the first test of American forces. You know, the big question was, would Americans be able to use the vast power, the mechanized power, the vast firepower that Americans could bring to bear to have an important battlefield um, impact in Vietnam. 
And what's what's fascinating about the Battle of Yadrang is that Americans came to the conclusion that, yeah, Americans did okay. You know, they suffered um, uh, pretty significant losses and it was, a, you know, a grisly and um, bloody affair without question. Um, but what's fascinating, I think, is that the North Vietnamese seem to have drawn roughly the same conclusion. They also studied the battle of the Yadrang Valley and came to the conclusion that they could fight effectively against Americans. And it could be, I, you know, I'm not really a military expert, but to my, uh, to my eye, both sides had a point, you know, the Americans did ultimately dominate the, the, the battlefield, but at very heavy cost, you could, call this an American victory because in the immediate sense, Americans achieved their objectives. But the North Vietnamese looked at the battle and concluded that they fought effectively against Americans for a time. When the losses got too heavy, they were able to withdraw from the battlefield and save their resources and manpower for another day. So the North Vietnamese were not wrong to see the battle in these terms. So I think that you know the, the battle is quite indicative of the patterns that would play out across the war, where Americans would uh, fight effectively um, if if effectiveness is judged by immediate battlefield results, but the North Vietnamese and their South Vietnamese allies could fight effectively in the sense that they could, you know, poke around the edges of the American force and and harass the Americans over a long period of time and uh, never suffer any sort of final defeat that would actually lead to a political settlement that cut against them. Mm. Of course, another similar battle like this, so now that you're talking about this, I would say is the te infamous Tet Offensive, which yeah. both sides as, as well claimed victory after the battle. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. Another, um, you know, really revealing mil military episode of the Vietnam War, because in a strict sense, I think it's probably fair to say that the South Vietnamese and the Americans won right they were able to even though the 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 offensive was a surprise mostly a surprise and achieved dramatic immediate gains for the communist forces yeah. within a matter of hours or at least days uh, americans and south vietnamese had pushed back the north vietnamese for the north vietnamese and viet cong forces and basically um uh, prevailed with the battle Hue City is a partial exception, but even there, Americans Marines ultimately um, re recaptured that that city. So, in a strict military sense, I think it's reasonable to say, okay, the South Vietnamese and Americans won. Uh, the 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 Tet Offensive was a big disaster for the communist forces, but in a political sense, it's quite fair to argue exactly the opposite. Uh, the um, uh, American Political leadership, the American home front by and large, seems to have drawn the lesson from the Tet Offensive that American forces were making no real headway. Yes, they had fought the communists to a stalemate, but they were by no means achieving victory. And after several years of war, thousands of body bags coming back to the United States and constant reassurances from American political leaders that Americans were winning and had good reason to believe that they would ultimately achieve their objectives. This was a devastating uh, fact to confront. The war was by no means over and was likely to drag on for a long time. So before we go further in Vietnam, there's something I want to talk about as well. And that's some power, maybe not a power in the sense, but that's a country you might not expect being in, involved in Vietnam. And I want to talk about Sweden's involvement in Vietnam for a bit, because that's a fascinating yeah. story as well. Yeah, um, so uh, I, I quite agree. Um, Sweden was one of many, many countries during the Vietnam War that made diplomatic efforts to encourage negotiations or even to mediate negotiations. Uh, but it was clearly one of the most important um, because I think it had, you know, the confidence of the American government and reasonable contacts and influence in the communist world um, as, as as well. So, um, you know, I, I think Sweden really stands out for um, for its ultimately failed efforts. But there was nothing unique about that. Every peace initiative. Uh, in the connection with the war, of course, failed. Um, 
but uh, the, the Swedish initiatives were certainly more um, consequential and, and more significant than many of the others. And of course, I do believe, I re remember reading somewhere, I don't, I don't remember where, but that they also helped soldiers, not soldiers, but Americans who did not want to draft into that. They helped them have exile, if you will, in Sweden for those who did not want to fight. Very, very true. It seems to me uh, Canada was easily the number one destination of, uh, of, of, of young American men who wanted to ev evade the draft. Uh, but Sweden, I, I believe I'm right in saying, was was by far the number two um, uh, destination. So Sweden played an important role in that as well. Uh, incidentally, uh, probably the most influential and important author in recent years to write about the Vietnam War uh, is uh, Swedish by origin, a, a gentleman named uh, Frederick Logoval, who now teaches at Harvard University. Mm. Interesting. So I want to go back to Vietnam. And of course, I'm going to refer to media as well, because in a lot of media and films and series alike, you see there's a lot of off the books offensives that they use that strictly illegal kind of in, in a sense where the soldiers go on off the records missions. It was that did that happen quite as a lot as the media seems to make it out or was it not that common to do, you know, off the books in kind of illegal missions for for the United States, M military missions. Yes. Um. Yeah. I mean, I I think it's fair to say that. Um. For example, uh, American combat forces were crossing over into formally neutral Cambodia all the time. It was a matter of routine. I think there's lots and lots and lots of commentary from ordinary American soldiers saying, yeah, you know, we, we, we crossed the border all the time in pursuit of the enemy, or maybe we didn't even know where the border was. Um, and so it was only natural that um, uh, Americans would cross that, that border um, uh, often in pursuit of communists who were using that territory um, as, as base areas close to um, the, the border of, of, of South Vietnam. The, the classic example though, I think of what you're getting at was the bombing of Cambodia that was undertaken in the early months of the Nixon administration. So Nixon came into office in January of 1969, and he um, wanted to send the message that he was not gonna be restrained by any of the limits that the Johnson administration had recognized. And among other things, he was going to unleash American bombers against Cambodia. And what's remarkable is that he he tried to do this in secret. And there was um, an elaborate conspiracy to um, to, um, um, to 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 alter the information, the navigational information that was uh, provided to the bomber crews. And then there was falsification of the records that were kept reflecting where bombs had been dropped. Now, it turned out that The New York Times caught wind of this um, it, before too long. And so it became public. And uh, this, of course, this episode unleashed um, a lot of uh, furor within the Nixon administration. There were all kinds of efforts to figure out who leaked this information, how the New York Times had gotten this information. And it's it's really not an exaggeration to say that the Watergate episode really had its earliest origins in the Nixon administration's um, desperation to figure out who leaked this information about illegal um, activities um, in Vietnam. So what may look like a relatively limited, though pretty shocking um, episode um, turned into something with huge consequences mm. for American history. And as we, we don't to talk about the weaponry and weapons soon, but before that, I want to talk about, you know, life as a soldier in Vietnam. And what was it like for a draftee or a volunteer to come to Vietnam for, you know, to serve the country? Yeah, you know, that's a hard question to answer because it, it seems to me that there were as many different experiences as there were individuals. And there have been a lot of attempts over the years to generalize and to say that this was the experience of the, the Vietnam servicemen or this was or this was. And I think the fact of the matter is that they're all legitimate. <laughs> um, and it's a reflection of the fact of just how politicized the war has become that so many people have been so desperate to say that this was how Americans experienced the war. Of course, it was 
a huge array of different experiences. But I will say this, you know, I think there's this idea very much encouraged by Hollywood that combat in Vietnam was a particularly stressful, fearful type of of of, of combat. Um, it was different from being a soldier in the Second World War or maybe even in Korea because it was fundamentally a guerrilla conflict where you couldn't necessarily know who was the enemy, who were your friends, sometimes your friends by day or your enemy by night. There was the fear of booby traps and ambushes because of the, the nature of the war, essentially a guerrilla war, especially mm -hmm. in its in its early, early days. Um, there was anxiety connected to the fact that uh, that the body count was the method for measuring progress rather than controlling territory. So servicemen would fight to regain the same piece of ground, you know, repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, and, and a point that's often been made is that this was terrible for morale. You know, you, as a soldier, you want to see progress. You know, you want to grab, you want to control a piece of territory and um, believe that you've accomplished something and not have to do it again. So, the, so the, the style of fighting, I think it's fair to say, was particularly stressful. But I will also finally just say this. The vast majority of Americans who went to Vietnam did not fight in combat. Um, the combat soldiers, important though they were, important though their experiences were, were supported by a huge rear echelon establishment. Um, the American military had then and still has today a very high, sometimes it's called the tooth to tail ratio. So relatively small numbers of servicemen were actually doing the combat and they were supported by huge uh, rear echelon support uh, elements that you know created these enormous bases with relatively comfortable facilities with air conditioning and and pretty good food and well stocked PXs mm. and and all the rest. Now I'm going to refer to my, talk about Mash and the comparison to Vietnam by the end of this <laughs> episode as well, of course. But they're, they're in the series. There is uh, this corporal clean, uh, sorry corporal cleaner who is trying to get. Um, discharged by proving that he is psychotic, that he is crazy by dressing up in female clothes and behaving unnatural and this and indisciplined. Right. Did, did this sort of thing happen that people try to get get a crazy discharge like clean, cleaner does in MASH? Kind of or is that <laughs> how how often did people try to get discharged from serving in Vietnam? You know, it's it it certainly happened. I I don't know that I can answer the question of how often. I'm, I'm not sure such a statistic exists, but I think anecdotally through the memoir literature, you know, there's some evidence of individuals, um, you know, um, feigning insanity or you know harming themselves physically in order to get out of service. So it certainly happened. It was certainly a real thing. I think that the better measures of discontent among American forces, especially in the latter parts of the war, are insubordination, use of drugs, um, just general uh, low generally low morale, difficulties that officers had in in um, in uh, mobilizing and 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 motivating their their troops. there's a legion, you know, a lot of evidence of of problems along those lines. So I think the bigger story was um, about soldiers who formally did their duty, but you know, under very, very difficult conditions with declining morale, uh, particularly as I say, after the Tet Offensive, the years in 1969, 1970, 71 were very, very different in this respect from 64, 65. And it's important not to generalize. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the treatment of the locals, local Vietnamese, and it did, because they did not look very high, very high friendly at them. Excuse me for the language, but they they call them like in Korea groups for and so again sorry for the language, but that's that they that's, they did not look at them as being as equals in, in other words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's true. I I would um just repeat what I said a moment ago that, mm. you know, American experiences in Vietnam were as varied as the number of Americans in Vietnam. And I think there's evidence that some Americans treated the local population with great respect and took seriously their task of building up this society and, and transforming it into a functional democratic society. But uh, 
what you say, what you suggest is also true. There were certainly Americans, there's plenty of evidence of this, who um, through fear or through outright racism or, or, or no doubt many, many other motives uh, treated the South Vietnamese population with with disrespect and um, you know everyday casual forms of disrespect, or perhaps brutal and lethal forms of disrespect, including you know targeting civilian areas without too much concern about you know who would get caught in the crossfire. So this was a, a very important reality of the war. I think there's no question about that, and I think most historians would agree that the brutality, the disrespect was ultimately deeply con uh, 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 counterproductive to American purposes because it tended to turn the local population against the uh, the American presence, which of course was ironically there to support them and build them yeah. up. Now, of course, a lot of so soldiers had did have sexual frustration as well when they were there. So, you know, a lot of women did get pregnant eventually. And do you know is what percentage did come with the soldiers back home to the United States after, you know, getting pregnant or even some marrying some of the local yeah. Vietnamese girls. You know, here too, I, I have to say, I don't have statistics at my fingertips, but it was certainly a widespread phenomenon. And in 1975, you know, when the United States evacuated South Vietnam, one of the priorities for the U.S. government was to evacuate um, the thousands of mixed race children um, who were categorized as orphans in South Vietnam, who everyone had good reason to expect would be treated rather brutally after the communist took over. So I think that's a pretty good barometer of how widespread this, this phenomenon um, this phenomenon was. Of course, now I, I want to talk about weapons used in the Vietnam War and arguably one of the most famous guns to come out of the machine guns to come out of the Vietnam War is, of course, the famous AK-47 and, of course, the failed yeah. horribly M-16. So let's talk about the M-16 versus the AK-47, which came out because of the war. Yeah, you know, I'm no expert on military technology, so I can only speak about this in general terms, but I'm certainly um, well aware that there uh, was a lot of frustration, uh, supposedly going to be the cornerstone of the American military forces during the Cold War period. Um, but it turned out in practice, it had a lot of limitations. I believe it was um, uh, fueled in a, in a way that made it, it uh, prone to um, you know, misfiring and all sorts of other mechanical misfunctions. And many Americans came to prefer the AK-47, uh, the, that is to say the communist weapon, the Kalashnikov, right? That was um, widespread among communist forces. Um, I, I can say anecdotally, I was with um, a group of uh, Vietnamese veterans in Vietnam several years ago now, and was really impressed by what I heard from uh, the the former servicemen on on the group about you know the differences between the AK-47 and the M16, and all of them had a pretty high regard for the for the AK-47. <laughs> I, I, again, to the book I mentioned earlier that I was reading, and then this mentioned he meant the author talked about how the MC team would misfire or not fire at all or go warm quite quickly, and but the government just kept producing them because they, you know, they want, did not want to use crummy weapons, or yeah. you know, they they basically sent a lot of soldiers to the deaths because of the failure of the M sixteen that we used that were used on the battlefield. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's that's interesting. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wish I knew more about this subject and and could comment on, you know, how the problems with the weapon really translated into, into vulnerabilities or deaths on on the battlefield. That that adds up to me, given what what I know about this this issue. Um, that said, I think we should be careful not to go too far and to embrace the idea that American military technology was somehow generally inferior to what the communists had available to them. Because speaking broadly, the amount of American firepower, the sophistication of American firepower was infinitely superior to what the communists were able to, to bring to bear. Um, yes, it's true that the Soviets and the Chinese provided a great deal of weaponry, 
but what the United States provided to the South Vietnamese and of course what the United States used itself was monumental in scale, right? There are all these famous statistics about the amount of, of ordnance dropped on both South and, Viet, and North Vietnam uh, exceeding, you know, the entire Pacific theater during the Second World War and, and so on. And these kinds of statistics, I think, really capture what the re reality of American firepower was. Now, before we go into media and uh, the hippies, the hippie movement in Vietnam, I want to talk about the communist, communist support, support for the Vietnam, Vietnamese, both Chinese and USSR, while the US sent troops to support the South. I don't believe there was much, there were a few, but there weren't many Russian troops in in the war. Mostly some were Chinese, but of course, they were mostly local the locals and there weren't many Russian support soldiers in there were they sent some engineers but they didn't yeah. send too many troops down there. Yeah, I think that's right. Um you know we now know and and uh some of this research has only been possible to do in relatively recent years that there were um at their peak 160 something thousand Chinese forces in North Vietnam. Now that's not to say that a single one of them fought on the battlefield in South Vietnam. The um, the Chinese contingent was in North Vietnam to do work in North Vietnam that would free up uh, North Vietnamese young people to go off and fight in the South. There was a very careful line drawn by the Chinese government against uh, any Chinese in directly engaging in uh, you know on the battlefields in the South, and I think this reflected Chinese fears of the war expanding just as the Korean War had um, in, in the fall of, of 1950. Uh, the Chinese wanted no part of Vietnam becoming a direct US-Chinese um, uh, war as, as Korea had, mm -hmm. had, had done. And we can talk about the reasons why the Chinese might have been reluctant if, if you like. Yes, as for thanks. the Soviets, well, <laughs> I think, and, and as, for the, as, for, <laughs> as for the Soviets, um, you know, it, it's certainly the case that the Soviets sent technicians into North Vietnam to help install um, and train uh, local forces to use very sophisticated, especially anti-aircraft weaponry or jets. Um, the Soviets, even though the Chinese supplied far greater amounts of military material to the North Vietnamese, the Soviets provided the most technologically sophisticated. So it, it was a, a rather routine thing, I think, um, across the peak years of the war for the uh, Soviets to send small numbers of technicians or trainers into North Vietnam to train uh, the, the North Vietnamese to use this equipment that was beyond the capabilities of the North Vietnamese military to manage by, by themselves. Uh, you asked about the the reluctance of maybe both superpowers to become directly engaged in the war. I think really by you know this this cuts against a little bit the conventional wisdom I think about the Korean about the Cold War, but the Soviets certainly wanted no part of a major war in in Southeast Asia. They really wanted to. Uh, ease the relationship with the United States and engage in serious arms control negotiations and lower the cost of military preparedness in the Soviet Union. This was at a time when the Soviet leadership was increasingly aware mm -hmm. that Soviet society had real problems, including the lack of consumer goods, the sclerotic nature of the economy, though it was very good at producing weapons, it wasn't very good at much else. So there was a sense that really the Cold War needed to be eased so that Soviet society could be reoriented for the long haul. So the prospect of a major war involving the United States um, in a way that would reduce American willingness to do arms control negotiations with the Soviets was distinctly unappealing. As for the Chinese, you know, by the, by 1966, 1967, you're talking about the era of the of the um, Cultural Revolution. In China, China was consumed with internal uh, controversies and um, and and really battles. I think is you know and and um, we you know we all probably have some sense of the horrors unleashed by the um, by by the Cultural Revolution. But China was in no position in 1966, 67, 68 to wage war against American forces in Southeast Asia. So they they knew they had to be very careful not to provoke such a war that would be very difficult for the Chinese to fight. 
No, it's, but as you know, in, in the Korean Wars, and, and they didn't know at the time, of course, Stalin didn't really have much interest in Korea. Was this the case in the USSR? I believe Khrushchev, at least in the beginning of the war, did, did he, he didn't really have much interest in Vietnam, same with us in Korea? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, I think in, in part of it, it was the the logic that I just laid out. Uh, Khrushchev had had mm. bigger international priorities than this this small country in in um, in in Southeast Asia. Interestingly, the Soviets in the mid nineteen fifties proposed UN membership for both North and, so and South Vietnam. There was no more kind of status quo oriented gesture than that. You know that that seemed to imply that there was no goal of reunifying Vietnam under communist uh, uh, under communist rule, right? And this was a Soviet initiative. I think it tells you something about yeah. Khrushchev's sort of status quo orientation, very cautious. And the Cuban Missile Crisis is a big exception. Um, but um, on the whole, it seems to me, the Soviets trended ac across the 1960s toward uh, greater caution in, in, the, um, in, in the international realm. But they could only go so far, right? Because the the Soviets and the Chinese, really from the late 1950s onward, were increasingly in a bitter rivalry with one another. Mm -hmm. And that rivalry was most fundamentally about leadership of the revolutionary anti-Western bloc in the third world, mm -hmm. both Moscow and Beijing claimed essentially that they were the leader of the international communist movement. And if the Soviets had failed to really support the North Vietnamese, they would have exposed themselves to brutal criticism from the Chinese, maybe effective criticism from the Chinese that the Soviets couldn't be counted on. You know, they were too status quo oriented, too cautious, too conservative, um, and therefore would squander their their claim to be the leaders of the Marxist Leninist movement. Um, globally. So the, the dynamic of the Sino-Soviet split really put limits on the ability of the Soviet Union to go too far toward promoting a, a peace and stability in Southeast Asia. It's a real bind for the Soviets, I think. Now, again, I'm sorry for keeping referring to Korean War, but as, in the, as well, in Korea, they were talking about nuking the North, and, it, and, and this came up during the Vietnam War as well, and as we know, Thankfully, it did not happen. But how close were we to an actual nuclear fallout in North Korea? That they were, were they just kind of playing with the playing with the idea? Was kind of like uh, they didn't really take think of think of it seriously, or was it close as close as we could have dropped that in Korea? Um, in Vietnam, look, I think that nuclear options were consistently considered as part of American war planning. Um, that fact, though, can create a somewhat misleading impression of actual intents to use those weapons. I mean, I, I would say that disturbing and frightening though it may be, it was the obligation of American military planners to think through every contingency. And of course, nuclear weapons were an important part of the American arsenal. Um, so it, I don't think it should surprise us that Americans thought about the possibility of using nuclear weapons. Um, the, the only time insofar, I think, as we're aware at this point, maybe historians will learn more in the years ahead, because these kinds of issues tend to be shrouded in secrecy, of course. The only time when I think nuclear weapons become a more important, more central part of American strategy in Vietnam was early on in the Nixon period, when Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger decided that they wanted to use American nuclear forces in a way that would convey to, especially the Soviets, that Americans were really serious about ending the Vietnam War on American terms and that the Soviets had better get on the program. So Americans um, uh, put their nuclear forces on high alert at one point and moved nuclear weapons around the globe in ways that they knew the Soviets would see. 
And so the intent here was to send the message that, look, you know, Americans now are really taking the gloves off and getting really serious about wanting to bring the war to an end on American terms and needed the Soviets to play their part in pushing the North Vietnamese to the bargaining table. And of course, as you know, the, the Soviets should play that game too, as in the, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Absolutely. Absolutely. They definitely cut both ways. <laughs> so, so let's talk about POWs, both on the US, at the treatment of POWs, both on the North and the US side, and how they, how they were treated when they, when they became POWs. Yeah. Um, so um, the, 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 the most famous American POWs, of course, were the, um, the air crews who bailed out or whose planes crashed over North Vietnam as uh, during the uh, extensive, massively extensive American bombing campaign against North Vietnam. Uh, so the earliest POWs of that sort were captured, you know, in the earliest phases of the war. And many of them spent years and years in American POW camps, uh, famously, you know, the Hanoi Hilton um, in, um, in in the, the North Vietnamese capital city. Um, there was some variation, certainly, in the stories that these POWs told upon their release in 1973. But uh, the bottom line is that they were treated rather brutally at many points during um, their incarceration in North Vietnam. Um, you know, they were pumped for information. They were used as propaganda uh, tools for the North Vietnamese government. It seems to me it's certainly one of the more shameful episodes in the history of the North Vietnamese state. And um, uh, you know, embodied the worst kind of exploitation of prisoners. Um, in ways that are certainly frowned on under international law, you know, for for political and propagandistic purposes. Sometimes people ask me why there weren't um, we we don't know more about POWs who were captured on southern battlefields. In other words, why weren't American combat forces in the South taken prisoner and you know held in the same way or or taken to North Vietnam? And I think there are two answers to that. One is that not that many were actually captured, but also that there tended to be local arrangements worked out um, in South Vietnam for prisoner swaps. So generally, Americans who were captured under those circumstances on southern battlefields would be um, returned uh, relatively relatively quickly. In, and again, I'm so, so sorry for referring, but it's the closest thing I, I can think of, and in Korea as well. Yeah, they were, you know, drilled almost daily. You know, they were asking questions about their home. They were taught re-education yeah. camps. Was this a case in Vietnam as well, where you, you know, would get interrogated, asked for your family, you know, asked about where, you, where are you from, and you know, taught Marxist idea ideals. Was this Russ re-education? Did it try to do this in the POW camps in Vietnam as well? You know, it's a great question. And I, I certainly don't want to say for a second that, you know, no American POW was subjected to indoctrination or anything like that. No doubt, no doubt that that kind of thing came up. It seems to me, though, to generalize the brutality um, that American POWs experienced in Vietnam was more aimed at simple punishment and kind of sadism, I suppose you could say, directed against those individuals, but also more directed against an effort to get you know, militarily useful information or propaganda value. I, I'm not aware that the North Vietnamese attached a particularly high importance to actual indoctrination or you know, actually encouraging defectors um, to to North Vietnam again. I don't want to say for a second that, that that didn't happen or that's not the way that American POWs experienced it. But I think it would be fair to say that that wasn't a particularly high priority insofar as we understand this experience. What about North Vietnamese POWs in U.S. military bases? Were they treated any better? Or were they worse? Perhaps treated? Were they subjected to any torture? Or what what was their treatment experience like compared to the U.S. troops in? in north in the north yeah i mean i think it was it, it is a decidedly mixed bag as as so many things are about the the vietnam war i think that you know you can certainly find examples of uh north vietnamese and um nlf viet cong prisoners who are treated reasonably well respectfully etc 
Um, but you can also certainly find many, many episodes of brutal treatment on that side too, including, you know, executions, torture. Um, a, a, a lot of this was um, was carried out by South Vietnamese authorities. So Vietnamese, whether North Vietnamese or NLF prisoners were, were typically handed over to the South Vietnamese for, um, you know, imprisonment and interrogation and so forth. So, um, you know, a, a lot of their treatment, came, mistreatment, uh, in many cases, came at the hands of South Vietnamese. Now, that said, I don't want to exonerate Americans because we know certainly that when high, potentially high value captives were subjected to questioning or torture, um, very oftentimes there would be American officers standing there, you know, watching or participating, sometimes CIA uh, officials as well, you know, listening in and suggesting lines of questioning and, and trying to make use of the intelligence that came as a result of that kind of interrogation. So, um, you know, the, the 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 bottom line, I suppose, is that there was an awful lot of mistreatment on on both sides. And let's talk about media presence. And again, I we to see this that there's certain lack of this in the Korean War, but in me in as media developed, of course, and you got TV screens of how almost every American or most in Western countries do have TVs, and you do have TV crews in Vietnam and they see all the things that are going on, the death, the horror, the combat and that's going on there. You do yeah. see this close up at home unlike unlike, unlike in WW World War Two where you yeah. they just heard it on the radio. It wasn't the kind of the same where they they did have massive support. So when did the hippie movement and the masses in the United States start going against and start protesting? The Vietnam War, and you do have songs written about this, and you know you have the massive yeah. hippie <laughs> movements, which, which is arguably one of the most famous opponents of the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anti-war activism is certainly visible as early as 1965. You know, maybe even on a smaller scale in in earlier times, but. You know, you start to see in the fall of 1965 significant anti-war activism, mostly on college campuses. Uh, famously, University of Michigan in the fall of 1965 was the scene of, you know, teach-ins and some of the, the early rumblings of what would grow into a much larger phenomenon. But anti-war activism certainly grew very dramatically across 1966. 1967 was a major year of growth as Americans became more frustrated by the lack of progress and, and more aware of the increasing cost in terms of economic cost, but most importantly, bloodshed. And, you know, 1968 and, and on and on one could go. I think that, um, you know, the statistics show that Americans steadily lost confidence in uh, the conduct of the war, more and more and more thought of the war as a mistake, as as the war um, advanced. I do think, though, that we need to be careful about generalizations about who it was who participated in the anti-war movement. I think that um, clearly there were, you use the term hippie, there were people associated with the countercultural movements or the rights movements of the 1960s who were drawn to anti-war activism. No question about that. And their critique of the United States tended to be pretty profound. You know, something badly had some, something had gone badly wrong with the United States. Um, it, it, the United States had been um, uh, had, had somewhere abandoned its democratic traditions, its sympathy for uh, people struggling to break free of colonialism. The United States had intervened in a civil war, essentially, because American industry wanted it that way or because the political interests of people at the top of the political system you know saw value in in war um so these kinds of arguments definitely appealed to to many people in what we could broadly call the anti-war movement but i think it's also important to recognize that the anti-war movement consisted of many americans especially as time passed who were rather moderate in their political outlook and even in their personal deportment and style, right? There were plenty of people, you know, men wearing ties and middle class, you know, families, women 
who were involved in the anti-war movement as well. And this was the thing that really worried, I think, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, you know, when the establishment, when, you know, quote unquote, respectable people started to protest against the war and against uh, the, the federal government, you know, that's when they knew they really had a problem. So we should think of the, the anti-war movement, I think, as as consisting of a number of different mm-hmm. strands, but avoid the, the the temptation, which I know is real, to see it strictly as students or hippies or people who were, you know, really prone to a very profound critique of the United States. Something I also thought about this as well, which is at the time, of course, during the Vietnam War, you get the the uh, these, you do have the segregation in America and the draftees of African Americans at a large degree has served in the Vietnam. How much of these African Americans were forced into the, because of course the racism was very much present at the time and you do have the movements that begins to develop during this time as well. But so let's talk yeah. about African Americans draftees into the war and how many were forced against their will even to serve in the war. Um, You know, I, <sighs> Forced, I suppose, is a is a loaded word. Um, um, you know, there were no doubt cases of young men, you know, being told by judges that they were either going to have to do jail time, you know, or join the American military. And I guess there's a kind of force there uh, toward, you know, um, uh, I would say that's very black. much that force. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fair, fair enough. So you know that kind that kind of thing happened, and and um, you know maybe force is the right word there, but um, you know I think that um, the, the better the better way to generalize this about this about this issue is that you know the economic opportunities available to so many Americans, white and black, but especially black in this period were so limited that military service had a certain, you know, disproportionate um, logic to it. It was a place, you know, to, to go for um, some sort of social advancement and, and opportunity. And of course, at a time when many uh, middle-class, typically white Americans understood how to manipulate the draft system so that they could avoid service or maybe get alternative service to a more peaceful theater. Uh, many African Americans who lacked those opportunities or lacked the sophistication to do that, you know, found that they were the ones who were most readily drafted. And once they were drafted, were serving in combat roles disproportionately and dying in disproportionate numbers as as well. I think that the real in, you know, there are many injustices here. So um, but one of the most conspicuous injustices has to do with the fact that so many African Americans were pushed into combat roles and then, you know, died or were wounded in disproportionate rates. So let's talk about the return soldiers that served at time in Vietnam. How because they were very kindly treated either, and a lot of them did get alcoholic problems from this. And we yeah. do I do believe we see this in a lot of media and films as well, where you know, returning soldiers being spat upon and they, they're not treated well, they expect the heroes welcome. Yeah. It's rather the opposite happens. Yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, again, you've heard me say this a lot, but I think, um, you know, generalization is is really problematic. There are as many homecoming experiences as there are veterans. But the, by and large, you know, the, um, the, the, the complaint that uh, American servicemen in Vietnam weren't welcomed back home with anywhere close to the kind of you know, enthusiasm and appreciation that earlier generations of servicemen had experienced that, that is, is unquestionably valid. You know, I think here, I, I know that there are many people who would disagree with what I'm about to say, but we should be careful not to exaggerate the outward hostility of mm-hmm the home front toward those returning veterans, the the spitting, you know, the shouting. Did it happen? Yes. I think there's enough evidence from people who had these experiences to know that, you know, this this was a real experience. But I think that the 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 more typical experience was simply to be ignored. And that of course hurts as well. That of course is a form of disrespect. 
but um, you know, I think that the the extent of spitting and kind of uh, outward hostility toward those you know Americans who had gone off and killed babies in Vietnam has been exaggerated by people who had a political purpose in later years in kind of currying favor with people who um, who were apt to um, you know to to lock on to this experience as as a political as a politically useful um, device. Speaking of political useful, I'm, I'm going to refer to Boris Johnson, and of course, and you know, this is when he meets Jenny again. She do get him up on the stage to talk about, and of course, in the movie, the he gets cut off uh, during his speech. But how often did this occur that pe- that you know people try to get the veterans on their side to speak out against what happened in Vietnam? Uh, cutting off veterans from from no being no able to no speak out. I, no that... you know uh in, in, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying in the movie you know Forrest Gump get cut off but you know yeah. I'm not saying but in how, yeah. how but how often did it occur that people yeah. did try to get veterans on their side to speak against what had their experience oh pardon me you know, yeah yeah the, um uh I you know I think in the latter parts of the war um this was a relatively common. Um, feature of anti-war activity. So, you know, having someone who had actually been in Vietnam and was willing to speak out was very powerful, you know, clearly very, very powerful um, rhetorical approach, you know, to rallying opinion against the war. And so um, this was, you know, I think this, again, I don't have a number uh, to, to sort of quantify this experience, but I think it's it's certainly fair to say that uh, particularly in you know after 1968, probably in the later years of the war, this became a, f- a feature of of anti-war activism. And of course, there was an, an organization, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, that made it relatively easy to find these people and to find their voices in American society. So let's of course talk about when. Well, at what point does the United States realize that they're not going to win this? This is going to drag on, and we don't have it gained anything from this war and when when did it finally get to the Paris Accord, which you know is one of the the final defeat yeah. the, the US admitting defeat from the Vietnam War. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think there is no single moment when things turned. Mm-hmm. Um so it the 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 road to Paris, if I can put it that way, is long and complicated. The way I would tell the story very briefly is is as follows. The Tet Offensive made clear to American political leaders and certainly to much of the American public that the United States could probably not achieve every last one of its objectives in Vietnam. And it's under those circumstances that the Johnson administration agreed to negotiations. But across 1968, across 1969, with Richard Nixon now in the White House, across 1970, American leaders still believed that they could accomplish core objectives. They still believed that they could get a deal with the North Vietnamese that would preserve an independent South Vietnam. And that was really the core goal the whole time. Only in 1971, I think that's the really pivotal year, did the Nixon administration finally accept that they were going to have to make some major concessions at the bargaining table in order to get an end to the war. And the most important concession that they made was to acknowledge that North Vietnamese forces could stay in South Vietnam following the removal of American forces. So this, as you, if you think about it, this was a major concession, right? The enemy, which had hundreds of thousands of troops on, on South Vietnamese terrain, you know, would be allowed to keep those troops there. Um, it, it didn't take a lot of imagination to see that, you know, those troops would probably start fighting again one day and, you know, finish the work of reunifying Vietnam under communist control. But Nixon and Kissinger hoped that if the United States pumped vast amounts of military equipment, economic aid, and all the rest into South Vietnam to buttress South Vietnamese forces, that they would be able to hold their own and preserve an independent South Vietnam indefinitely, even with those North Vietnamese forces on on their on their ground. But again, I think 1971 is that time when the Nixon administration realized that it really wasn't 
that, that, that concessions were going to be necessary. Um, and then ultimately they make a couple of more pretty significant concessions that lead to the, the Paris Agreement in early 1973. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about alternative history, and I know historians hate this, but uh, that's still, and somebody we haven't mentioned yet is Kennedy, and he, who was, of course, assassinated in 63, but if he hasn't been assassinated in 63, how different would the, the Vietnam War have looked had he still kept Jordan as maybe a second term as president? It's, it's such an interesting question, and one I've spent a lot of time thinking about, at one point I, in my career, I really thought there was very little to this idea that Kennedy was somehow different. There was a lot of romanticization here of, you know, Camelot and Kennedy. And um, in the end, he would have behaved exactly as Lyndon Johnson did. But I will say that the more I've looked at the record, the more I've written my own work and, and heard others speak about this, I think there is a powerful argument that Kennedy was fundamentally different. He is someone who had, despite the rhetoric of paying any price, bearing any burden, you know, of waging the Cold War more assertively, he was, if you look at his actual behavior, quite cautious about the use of American force and especially American combat troops. So, you know, if this if the same deterioration of the political situation in South Vietnam had occurred under his watch, I think there's good reason to think that he would have, of course, um, increased American economic support, military uh, equipment, maybe more and more military advisors, but he would have stopped short of the introduction of American combat forces on anywhere close to the scale that Lyndon Johnson was willing to do. Now, some people will say, well, okay, but what if that hadn't worked? Would he have been willing to go to that next step? And I think that's where the question gets difficult. You know, Would he have been willing to tolerate the loss of South Vietnam rather than do what Lyndon Johnson ultimately did? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Here, I mean, you really just have to read, I think, his his personality, his larger track record. I think that if this crisis came after he was safely reelected in 1964, there's some reason to believe that he would have been willing probably to try to get some sort of face saving uh, negotiated agreement that would have amounted to an American defeat in Vietnam. But at least, you know, it could have probably been done through some sort of um, face-saving uh, negotiated mechanism. I think that's the path that Kennedy probably would have worked toward. Of course, in 1162-63, which is Vice David King, he does imagine a nuclear fallout. And I, it's, though it's, that's not what the book is about, it's, of course, I don't think he would have come to a nuclear fallout in if Kennedy still had lived on. Say, say that one more time. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry. Sorry. In, sorry, in 11.22.63 by Stephen King, yeah. which I don't know if you read, but he right. did imagine a nuclear fallout after the, after the consequences of saving Kennedy in the book and both in the series as well. But I don't, uh -huh. I somehow don't think that it would have gone that far in during under the Kennedy administration. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've not read that book, to be perfectly honest, but... Um... You know, I think that what one of the things that jumps out at me about President Kennedy, whatever flaws he may have possessed, I think really of all Cold War presidents, he was the most concerned about nuclear war, the most familiar with what war meant from his own experience, and the most eager to avoid crises that would push the world to the brink of of nuclear war and um you know his behavior during the the cuban missile crisis i think um is is um is striking in in this respect of course i want to end with uh, the me popular media and of course hollywood movies and series and fictional books regarding the vietnam war how and how it was popularized and of course mash though it is said as you mentioned, it's set in Korea. It's very much a commentary to the Vietnam War and how many, how accurately the, what does some movies, these movies and series or books portray the Vietnam War? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's a question I've asked over the years to veterans, um, try to get their sense of, you know, if you have to send students to one movie, you know, that kind of captures what the war was like, you know, where, where, where would you send them? And 
there's a there's a variety of responses very very much including none of them forget it right no no movie has come even close but i i will say that i think that the movie that i hear spoken of more frequently than any other is probably platoon the movie from the uh, I believe it was 1986. In any case, the sort of mid to late 1980s that tried to capture, you know, the the, the basic battlefield realities. Um, and uh, you know, that's the one that I've tended for for better or worse to uh, suggest that my students look at with a critical eye and being careful, you know, not to buy everything, but to get a sense of you know what combat might have felt like. Um, in Vietnam. But I, you know, I think that the most fascinating thing about the, the Hollywood movies is not the extent to which they're accurate or not, but is the extent to which they reflect the larger public debate uh and, and the larger controversies around the war. So you have, you know, profoundly anti-war movies like um Full Metal Jacket, or I think Platoon in many ways is an anti-war movie, or um, or um um uh, apocalypse now right but you also have um the um the rambo series mm -hmm. and the other movies of that genre that came in, more in, vietnam, in the 1980s one. say that again in more in vietnam to mention one well, yeah for us, exactly you know, very much something we talked about Exactly. Exactly. You, you know, I think I've never done this, but it would be interesting to, you know, do a course about the afterlife of the Vietnam War entirely through films, because I think every position about the war that's taken that's been taken politically and culturally is well represented in the array of movies that have been released over the years. Um, so the debate has been carried on through movies as much as it's been carried on through scholarship or political discourse or music or any other arena where, where you might look. I want to end because we've done talk, talk the, well, good part of over an hour now about the Vietnam War and I think we're going to round it up soon, but I want to end with the question, how, how does Vietnam, what is Vietnam like to, in, to, today in 2023 and how much is the consequence of the Vietnam War still present in Vietnam today? I think people who go to Vietnam are often impressed by how little um, there is in, in the way of, you know, artifacts or um, reminders of the war. Of course, it's there if you look for it. And many Americans travel there looking for it. And then, you know, I think have really helpful and informative experiences by traveling there. I was, as I mentioned earlier, fortunate enough to do that once. But um, I, I think, you know, on, on the whole, what's striking about Vietnam these days is how young a society it is. You know, there there's something something like um, seventy percent of the population, you know, is under twenty five. Or I mean, I may have that statistic slightly off, but the the bottom line is that there are very few people in the society whose memories go back that far. And by the way, since the American War, Vietnam had another very searing experience, in some ways more searing experience, um, in the geopolitical realm that I think left a more bitter aftertaste. And that was the brief but very intense war against China in 1979. Um, and the whole tension and rivalry with China, I think, is really the dominant feature of international life for, for Vietnam. And these days, of course, I think that you know the, the relationship with China remains the, the central question for the Vietnamese state in 2023. China is obviously the dominant power in, in the region. And um, to some extent, Vietnam has made its peace with that and has to, has no option but to be part of that constellation of nations and, and political networks and economic networks and so forth. But Vietnam, of course, also has a strong incentive to counterbalance that reliance on China with uh, connections to the West. So U.S.-Vietnamese relations are rather strong, particularly in the national security field um, these days. And that has been one of the maybe surprising outcomes of the last you know 30 years or so since relations were normalized. It's still a one-party system, though party Correct. party country, I believe. Yeah, that's that's correct, and certainly there remain, um, you know, lingering and sometimes very acute uh, disagreements with the United States over human rights and you know uh, political questions, 
Uh, there's no, there's no question about that. I don't for a second mean to minimize the the human rights problems that remain a real fact of life in Vietnam. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm going to run it up there before you go. Do you have any books you want to promote? Any links you want me to put down in the description or social media where people might follow you or ask you questions? If they have any further questions sure. about the Vietnam War. Well, I would um, thank you for that opportunity. The The book that probably would be most suited to folks who might be drawn to the podcast is this one that I published a few years ago, simply called The Vietnam War, A Concise International History, published by Oxford University Press. It's a narrative of the whole war and touches on many of the questions that we've um, we've been discussing today. I also have a more recent book, which is called The End of Ambition, The United States and the Third World in the Vietnam Era which looks, as you can tell from the title, um, broadly at American policy toward uh, Africa, Asia, um, and Latin America in the in the period from the early 60s to the early 70s. Of course, for those who are just listening to this podcast and are not watching on YouTube, would you mind telling us what the first book you hold up is called and where, where people might find it if they should be interested in buying it? Uh, the first one I mentioned, The Vietnam War, A Concise International History, uh, which was published by Oxford University Press. And it's certainly available um, through Amazon and, of course, through Oxford University Press itself. So both of those websites would be good places to go to find it. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast and talk about the Vietnam War. This has been with that age 12 video you can find us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts these days. And of course, if you're on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave a little review if you like this episode. You can also find more episodes. You probably do have one or two episodes that you would like, I hope. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.